Good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. The purpose of this message is to give glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, our kinsman, Redeemer, our great Lord and King. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And in him we have life. Praise be. Praise be to the Lord Jesus. So I would like to review a couple of things here. One, uh, some of the, t the timing involved. And uh, in uh, the uh, advent of the Lord. And also some of the contrasts that we see in it between the world uh, and the Lord. I'd just like to start, though, by asking uh, a question. And that is, what is, in your opinion, the worst sins or sin that you see on the face of the earth? Now, we have been made privy to some simply dreadful uh, acts that have been done recently. In our study of history, we see uh, all sorts of other dreadful things going on. Uh, would you say that, uh, would you say that genocide is one of the worst things that goes on? Is one of the greatest of sins? And what about uh, the sexual sins? What about the uh, horrible things that are done to children who are sold into sexual slavery, who are kidnapped. All of the horrible things that go on on the face of this earth. It's, it's, not, that, it's not that heaven is callous to or dismissive of all these horrible things but yet it is not the greatest of the sins. The greatest of the sins is disobedience, and we are all guilty of it. Our disobedience to our wonderful, loving, just, caring, powerful Creator God who made everything, what right do we have to say to Him, I will not have you rule over me. How dreadful a thing it is. It is unforgivable. And we are all guilty. And we have no remedy. We cannot, we cannot atone for this thing that we do. It is the root of of all the other dreadful things that happen on the face of this earth. But we don't do all of those things. But we are disobedient. And what joy, what wonderful transports of joy when we find that God is going to remedy this for us a thing that we could not do within our own power, no matter how earnestly we wanted to accomplish it. Only he has the power to do it. I'd like to begin by reading in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 17. I'm in the New, uh, New American Standard. If you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but the precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown from the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. 
since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flowers of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever, and this is the word that which was preached to you. So I'd like to look at how this story unfolded to us. If I did every reference, if I, uh, we would be here until this afternoon, but um, cutting them down. And let's start uh, at the beginning here in Je Genesis chapter 3. And verse 15, uh, the fall has occurred and the disobedience has begun. And he is addressing each of the three involved. And when he addresses the serpent, Satan, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your heel, bruise you on, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This is, of course, talking about the Lord. And if we see bruising in the terms of what happened to the heel of the Lord, a more being hammered through it, then that same thing will happen <coughs> to Satan. He will be defeated. So from that point, we now expect, because it is from the seed of the woman, we expect that he will come as a child. That tells us that. Not as like an angel fully formed or one of his pre-incarnate uh, 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 visits, but here he will come as a child. Let's go to Isaiah seven fourteen, seven, Isaiah seven, verse fourteen. This is in a conversation with a king, a bad king of Judah, Ahaz, and he has declined a sign. And here was where the Lord, through his prophet, slips this in. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is God with us. So now we know that he will be born of a woman, but we also know that he will have deity. He will be God. So he will be God and man, both. Genesis chapter 12. You know, there are a lot of people who believe in a lot of deities of one sort or another. But one surefire proof of the real God is that he knows the future and he can tell us what is going to happen hundreds of years before it happens. He's talking to Abraham now and he says, I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Of course, Abraham is in the lineage of Christ. And that is how the whole world will be blessed 
through Christ himself. Isaiah 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit in upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations, plural, to everyone. Isaiah 9. People who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine upon them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase the gladness. They will be glad in your presence. As with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil, For you shall break the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, as with the battle of Midian. For every boot of booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful. Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And we go to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when in the fullness of time, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. So I'd like to do two things with this time. I'd like to first of all show how we got confirmation of this timing. And nobody who had the scriptures should have been ignorant of it. And second of all, I'd like to analyze a little the timing. Okay. First of all, Genesis 49, pretty early on. Genesis 49, and this is where Jacob is blessing his sons, and he is uh, blessing them, and also he is prophesying over his sons. And he comes to Judah, and we're on verse uh, 8 through 10. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares rouse him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, 
nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So here we see the obedience. This Shiloh is another word for the Messiah. Not until the scepter departs from Judah. Well, when did the scepter depart from Judah? Now, what is a scepter, by the way? A scepter can be an ornament, or they have an ornament that it represents the scepter, uh, but the scepter essentially is the authority of government, the authority over life and death. If, the, if the, a nation has that authority, then it is not murder when they kill somebody for, doing, for breaking a law. So, when did they lose the scepter? They lost the scepter in 6 AD, over 1,800 years from when this was said. Okay? What happened? Herod died in BC 4. The Lord is already born because it was Herod who tried to kill him. Herod dies, and his kingdom is split into three main parts of his sons. The son who gets Judea, Judah, is Archelaus. And Archelaus ruled from 4 BC to 6 AD by our dating. What happened? Well, Rome... Rome preferred to run things using the local folks or local bullies, or bullies that might not be local, like the Edomians, uh, who was, was the Herod crowd. They didn't like to make provinces and install governors. They governed uh, uh, this whole area from Syria. But Archelaus was such a mess for, uh, he, he caused or allowed to happen such unrest and, and there was so much killing. Thousands were killed. And of course, Rome didn't like that because everybody is a taxpayer and they don't like to lose the taxpayers. And so Archelaus had to go. In 6 AD, he was summoned. He was, his kingdom was taken away from him and he was banished to Gaul. And here's a rabbinical writing of the time. Woe unto us, for the scepter has departed. In other words, it became a Roman province under direct Roman rule, which would mean that death sentences for, for uh, offenses against uh, the law, uh, the, against the Levitical law, if they weren't death sentences in the Roman law, they would not be applied because we're now under Roman law. And so that, so in a way, they're no, they're no longer able to exercise the law fully because they can't put people to death for the sexual crime, for the sexual sins, which are punishable by death, and also blasphemy. Woe unto us! This writer says, The scepter has departed from Judah, and the Messiah has not come. But of course he didn't know that the Messiah was already there. So then we go to Daniel chapter 9. Verse 20. Now while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, in behalf of the holy mountain of God, 
While I was still speaking in prayer, then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision previously, came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. He gave me instruction and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications the command was issued, and I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression. You will find some translations will say disobedience. It will be, it's bringing an end to the disobedience. To make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. So that you are to know and discern that from issuing of the decree to restore the rebuild, restore and rebuild Jerusalem, this is the wall, this is the edict which was given to, to uh, Nehemiah by Artaxerxes, okay? Rebuild Jerusalem, Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again in the plaza and moat, even at times of distress. A week is seven years, all right? Sixty-nine weeks, if you take the date of that issuance of the decree, it exactly, at 69, we, 69 years, uh, sorry, wait a minute, a week is, not 69 years, 69, uh, it's 69 times seven that exactly brings you, and it's a complicated process because you're going through two different calendar processes, at least, brings you to the day that the Lord entered uh, on, uh, uh, the, on, on the back of a donkey, when he, uh, the triumphal entry into the city. Uh, if you look at Nehemiah, uh, it's interesting that in verse, in, in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, verse 6. Let your, <coughs> uh, it says, uh, I said, uh, sorry, uh, verse 5, I said, beseech you, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear now be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, which I am praying before you now night and day on behalf of the sons of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the sons of Israel, which we have sinned against you, I and my father's house have sinned. So he, just like Daniel, is asking for forgiveness of the nation, confessing the sins of the nation, and confessing his individual sins as well, as this whole thing is being put together. So I'd like to look at some practical considerations with regard to the time when Christ came. I'm not absolutely sure that these are factors, but it would appear to me that it's worth looking at them. He came at the time when the Roman Empire was almost at its zenith. Now the one thing the Romans did in their, in their, uh, in their empire building was they built roads. In the course of the Roman Empire, it's calculated that they built a quarter of a million miles of road. They started building roads in 300 BC and ran right through into uh, the first half of the millennia, first millennia. I remember as a child, my parents telling me, we're on a Roman road. 
And there are a lot of roads in, in England that are Roman roads. They've just stayed there, you know. And I mean, they've got macadam on them now and so forth like that, but because it would just go straight up and down. They just went straight as a die. They didn't wind around uh, uh, places. They went straight. The whole idea was to be able to move soldiers quickly. Okay. But this, is, this goes from Britain to uh, almost all of uh, Western Europe and also goes into Asia Minor. Moreover, although Rome was not a, a maritime uh, empire per se, they nevertheless encouraged trade because this was money. And the shipbuilding, uh, lar quite large ships were built. Uh, think about uh, the fact that Paul uh, uh, would uh, left uh, one place and went to Athens. I can't remember where he left. And he left Timothy and Silas behind. And his confident expectation that they would follow after him. Well, that was because there was regular sea trade. There were regular ships plying back and forth. When, when Paul himself uh, is about to be shipwrecked, we find that, in fact, there were 200, nearly 300 people on that boat. That had to be a 150, 160-foot boat for that many people to be on it, at least. There's, uh, some historians are saying that uh, these vessels carried up to 350 tons. Rome was a very unusual empire because when it fell, there was no strong empire to replace it. It imploded into its own mess. And in fact, statistics uh, of Rome are extraordinary. It, it's the second millennia before any ships of that size are built. It's, uh, it's the 19th century before a city is as large as Rome. 19th century. And that was London. Uh, it was probably the middle of the second millennia before uh, uh, bridge building and uh, other uh, uh, engi uh, civil engineering caught up with Rome. But here was a large empire with a sophisticated tr uh, transportation system, a, uh, a strong law to keep uh, travel as safe as possible. And this was the time, this was the time that Christ came. Then you could look at it another way. And if you looked at it from the idea that the gospel has a life and that God determined the life of that gospel to be a certain period and that he knew when that was going to end, we now draw back from the end of it to the beginning rather than the beginning of it to the end. But God is able to work it both ways anyway. Now I'm in speculative area here and I, and I, uh, and certainly you can disagree with me, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, verse 14. Here, this is the Olivet Discourse, and he says in verse 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So are we getting close to having preached the gospel in every nation? I believe we are. I believe we're in a unique time of communication with the internet. Uh, I think that uh, we're also uh, in a unique time because the barriers of language are being broken down by technology. And that was the barrier 
from against globalism that the Lord introduced at the Tower of Babel. And what does the Lord say at the t when he visits and when he comes to see the tower? He says, these people can accomplish anything they put their minds to. Or I've paraphrased it. Are we getting close to the point where God is going to call an end to it? Some of these things. I'm, I know that, that, that I was uh, watching uh, something last night where one of the people involved with AI says, actually, once we load it in there, it starts doing things that we don't even understand why it's doing them. Because I've always looked at databases with the view that, that man has, has done everything, okay? And so it's not going to do anything outside of what man has already told it to do. What is AI? AI is a, is a natural development of massive databases instead of, of uh, then processing information differently of being able to categorize information very, very uh, accurately within these vast databases. I mean, I mean don't you remember back in uh, the 80s and 90s how much, how, how a space was a problem, how, the, how size was a problem? Well, that's been, that's been eliminated. This is, we've gone through the technological barrier here with space. Now there is just limitless space on these, com on these computers, in these databases. Is it possible that we're in a sort of tower of, uh, a repeat of the Tower of Babel? That we're about to, we're about to do things which should never be done. And that, what happens if, in fact, that the life of the gospel was 2,000 years, two millennia? <clears throat> that means we're less than a decade away from the end. So these, I'm being speculative. Uh, this is a, a, a timing uh, thing. Uh, I believe also. I believe in the origin, uh, practical issues of the origin timing. But I am more comfortable be believing not in practical issues, but in spiritual issues, because I believe the timing of the gospel was a very special s spiritual issue, because until Christ came. The hope was deferred. He says, and the Messiah has not come. But we, <clears throat> we know that he did. And then <clears throat> I am running low on time. I wanted to uh, look at uh, the contrasts that the Lord sets up. We've just done in both the men's Bible study and on Tuesday nights, we're working in uh, First John in Tuesday night and James in the men's Bible study. And we have said, do not be conformed to this world. Uh, do not make, be a friend of this world, because if you're a friend of this world, you're an enemy to God. And this talks about not just the horrible things that happen in this world, it talks about the whole issue of disobedience. Disobedience makes the entire world an enemy of God. And, he, and, this, and this disobedience can, can only be atoned for by Christ, and we can, only, we can only have that atonement by believing in him. It is a dreadful power that must be eradicated it has an eternal punishment. If you die in your sins, you will go to hell forever. And so, when he brings his son into this earth, he doesn't bring him into a rich, influential family. He brings them into a humble family that has bowed their knee to him. And he doesn't even have him born in a palatial place. 
any of you who have seen, uh, have seen uh, any of you who, who are into history and, and have respect for Winston Churchill, and he has some attributes which would deserve respect. He was born in Blenheim Palace, which is this huge mansion in uh, 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 near London. And uh, so when the Lord brought his son, he had him born uh, in the area where the, the animals are kept. So in a typical house in that era, there would be the lower area in which would house the animals. Up above would be the living area of the family. And above that would be the guest house for those visiting. They were going to a home that was, was ready to receive them, but by the time they got there, somebody was already upstairs. And so they had to go to the only other space, which may have been a cave of some sort at the back of the house or something. But nevertheless, it wasn't because there was no room at the Holiday Inn. Okay, I mean, we know that this is, a, this is how things worked. And so there was no room for them. So he was born in humble circumstances. And then look at what happens as soon as he is here. The contrast is, now, and this is Matthew 2, now if Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he, he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and have come to worship him. And indeed that does mean worship him. In other words, he is already God, he is already a king. How many babies can be said that have said? None. And we have come to worship him. And then, of course, Herod tries to kill him. And we have, of course, the prophecy of uh, the weeping of Rachel in Rama, as Herod slaughters the babies. We also see that he has to flee. Of course, he had to flee before that happened. And then when he came back, we have another touch of history here. In, uh, uh, he was sent to Egypt, verse 19, but Herod died, this is still in Matthew chapter 2, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee. So in other words, we can date his return to being no later than AD 6 from Egypt. We can date that return because Archelaus was no longer there after 6, uh, uh, AD 6. And came and lived in the city of Nazareth. This was to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now there's a slight difficulty with this interpretation here because it is uh, almost certainly uh, a, uh, an epithet of some sort. Nazarene being an epithet rather than a place. It's saying he will be of no account. He will go to a region where no one good comes from, as it were. All right, and that's why he's saying he will be despised. So, <clears throat> my, my purpose is that we can, that we can glorify him and wonder at this extraordinary uh, story 
how the Lord determined this before ever there was sin. How he came to rescue us. To do what we couldn't possibly do ourselves. Where in all the tales of mankind is anything quite like this? We are all an offense against God. And yet he has brought us to be his friend and his child through the work of his son. And he deserves to be the one who can open the seals in heaven. He deserves all the glory. He's telling the truth when he says all things are placed under my authority. He deserves to be able to come back and judge this world. And because of our faith in him, we are not included in that. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for being who you are, a God of mercy, who looked at our status and knew there was nothing we could do. You have defied all these things by sending your Son. You defied defied all the expectations of the heavenly host that you would rescue us. The angels look upon this with interest and awe. And we are made free by the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give him the glory and honor. Amen.